Hello, my name is Danielle Snowflack, and I am the Director of Education, Professional Development, and Outreach at the American Society of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, or ASBMB. The ASBMB is a nonprofit scientific and educational organization with over 12,000 members. Founded in 1906, the society is based in Rockville, Maryland, and publishes the Journal of Biological Chemistry, Molecular and Cellular Proteomics, and the Journal of Lipid Research. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Lab Basics, Introduction to Responsible Conduct of Research, hosted by the ASBMB Education and Professional Development Committee. If you have problems connecting to the webinar audio through your computer, you can connect via phone at the number in the chat box. If you connect via phone, you must mute your phone through the entirety of the webinar. All phone users can be heard within the webinar suite and you'll have extreme difficulty delivering the webinar to all participants if we have background noise. And before we introduce today's speaker, I'd like to direct you to a few features in the webinar room. First of all, this will be an interactive webinar. During the presentation, we will review a case study where a scientist finds themselves in an ethical dilemma. We will be polling the audience with some questions related to the case study. Be sure to answer the questions promptly so that we can discuss the answers. Second, throughout the presentation today, we will be accepting questions. You can submit a question through the Q&A box on the right side of your screen. We will attempt to address questions throughout the webinar. In the interest of time, we may find that we need to hold some questions until the end of the webinar. We will provide time to answer previously submitted as well as new questions at the conclusion of the presentation. With that, let's get started. Today, we are here to discuss responsible conduct of research as a scientist. Good research practices are more than just following a protocol and keeping your notebook up to date. Besides avoiding obvious research misconduct through fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism, scientists must consider the ethical implications of their research before even picking up a pipette. For new scientists or even experienced researchers, these are difficult waters to navigate. This webinar discusses the ways we can con conduct our research in a safe, ethical manner. I'd like to introduce Dr. Suzanne Barbour, who is the Dean of the University of Georgia Graduate School and professor in the, professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. Suzanne was a professor of biochemistry and molecular biology at Virginia Commonwealth, Uni Commonwealth University for nearly 25 years. While at VCU, she worked with Dr. Frank McCrenna, who quite literally wrote the textbook on responsible conduct of research. His book, Scientific Integrity, is one of the primary textbooks used in the field today. She also worked at the National Science Foundation as a program director before moving to the University of Georgia. Suzanne is also a member of both ASBMB Education and Professional Development Committee and the ASBMB Minority Affairs Committee. Thank you so much for joining us today, Suzanne. At this point, I'm going to turn over the presentation to you. Okay, thank you, Danielle. I hope everyone can hear me well. I want to thank the ASBMB and thank Danielle for allowing me to give you this presentation today on a very, very important topic. Um, and I'm clicking through trying to get my slides. Oh, sorry, here. We're going right here. Okay, awesome. Ah, there we go. So again, this is just going to be a, an introduction to the responsible conduct of research. Um, I'm going to hit the tops of the mountains on this for you. Um, there's a lot more information to be had, a lot more to be discovered, and I would encourage you after the webinar to follow up with your own institutions and take the courses and workshops that are available to you through those means. So I'm going to start by reading this statement because I think it sets the tone for everything we're going to talk about today. Though it is very important to know and understand the rules and authorities under which one's professional work is governed, and to have the conviction and integrity to follow those rules, it is equally important to develop skills to reflect on those rules, their purpose, scope, and limitations, and to reflect on, on the relationship between one's personal values and, the, and what the rules imply. And that really is what the responsible conduct of research is about. It's about recognizing that we all come to the table, or I should say to the lab bench, with a certain set of expectations, a certain set of biases, a certain set of intentions. And the whole idea here is to ensure that we use, we minimize our biases and we direct our intentions in a way that ensures the integrity of the process so we can trust the research that we generate. So the reason that's so important is um, for some of the reasons you see on this slide. Um, the research we do as biochemists has um, implications not just on ourselves and our professional community, but also on the larger community as a whole. For example, some of the work we do has implications in terms of the health and safety of humans, animals, and the environment. And in fact, environmental impact is another potential impact of the work that we do in biochemistry. 
Some of our work has even broader implications that may impact on social, political, and economic issues that span not just our own institutions, but potentially the globe. There's also the possibility that our research may have um, unintended interactions with prevailing cultural or even institutional norms. And so based on this, it's important to understand how to conduct research in an ethical and appropriate manner. And we as educators in, um, in biochemistry have developed mechanisms to train our students to conduct research in a responsible manner. So what does that responsible, that responsible training look like? Um, what kinds of skills do you need to be an ethical biochemical, biochemistry and molecular biology researcher? Um, I think some of those skills are listed on this slide. You know, clearly you need to think critically and logically, and by critically I mean you need to ask yourself the question, why am I doing this experiment? What am I expecting to get from this experiment? And is the, this the appropriate experiment to do? We also have to avoid, avoid bias. Um, every single one of us has bias. Um, many of those biases are so buried within ourselves, we don't even recognize that we are biased. Um, but we cannot get rid of bias. Bias is not something that you, um, that you remove. Bias is something that you manage, and we'll talk a little more about that later on. You also need to be in a position where you have sufficient knowledge that you know whether the sources you're using to make your decisions are trustworthy. Um, that, in large part, is dependent on your education, your exposure to, um, to, to issues that are related to the work you're doing. Um, but again, it's important that you um, recognize that some, some sources are trustworthy and others are not. It's important to recognize the various terms and concepts that are involved in the responsible conduct of research. We'll hit on some of those concepts today. Um, recognize, again, that there are others we won't be able to hit on. But unless you know the, con the concepts and the terms, you, can't, you don't really have a framework to conduct your, your research ethically. Cognitive empathy is important. It's important to recognize that as, as much as you're excited about your work, your work has the potential to impact on others. And so it's important to think about your work, not just in the context of who you are and what your needs are, but also, in the needs of, uh, also based on the needs of the larger community as a whole. And then finally, and I can't, I can't emphasize the last bullet point enough, it's also important to, to, um, to use skills related to openness, patience, persistence, curiosity, and most importantly, humility. It's humility that will cause you to pause and think and ask yourself the question, am I doing the right experiment? Am I doing it for the right reasons? Am I interpreting these data in a way that they will ultimately impact on the community in the most appropriate way? Um, absent humility, one tends to make decisions that are based um, solely on one's own um, personal frame of reference, and that in turn often leads to poor decision making and to research that either cannot be trusted or that is literally unethical. So guess what? ASBMB has its own code of ethics. I thought it was important at the beginning of the webinar to talk a little bit about that code of ethics and introduce you to it. And I think the first thing you'll see here is there are three sections of this code of ethics. One section addresses our obligations to the public, and by public that goes beyond just people who are biochemists or molecular biologists, and we might meet at a meeting or uh, might read our papers in a journal. That is indeed the general public. I won't go through all the bullet points in this section, but just recognize that this largely deals with the fact that much of the research we do in biochemistry is actually funded by public dollars. That's where NIH gets its dollars. That's where NSF gets its dollars. And so because we have public funding, we in turn have an obligation to, um, to be responsible to the general public. The second section you see there relates to our responsibilities to other investigators. And that is, again, our colleagues in biochemistry and molecular biology who might run into us, run into us at a meeting or perhaps read our paper in a journal. Um, here it becomes important to ensure that the research we're doing is, um, can be reproduced, that it's accurate, that our interpretations are appropriate, and that we're sharing our work in a way that others in our research community can, can consume it and ultimately build on it. <coughs> the third section that you see at the bottom is a very, very important section. It's very important to the ASBMB. And that is that much of the research we do in biochemistry is actually conducted by trainees by students, even students as young as high school students, by undergraduates, by graduate students, by postdocs, um, by people who are in a training phase and are essentially using our research as an opportunity to further their careers. It's important for us as biochemistry and molecular biology researchers to recognize that we are in the business of not just collecting data, but also helping the people who collect those data for us to build on their careers so they can ultimately aspire to the career paths of their choice. So much of what I've just described are, are common issues that we discuss when we talk about professional ethics. And biochemistry and molecular biology is not the only community that's having this discussion. Again, I won't go through all the bullets on, bullet points on this slide. Just recognize we're going to hit a few, um, a few high points today. 
We'll talk about conflict of interest. We'll talk about publishing. We'll spend some time talking about authorship because that's an issue that comes up very often um, in, um, in responsible conduct of research. We'll talk about the peer review that ultimately um, drives authorship, ultimately, ultimately drives authorship. And then plagiarism I'll talk about in the context of the um, research misconduct. Um, I'll also spend some time talking about mentoring, which is something that's very near and dear to my heart. And again, an essential component of the ethical practice of, of biochemistry and molecular biology research, because so much of our research depends on the trainees who are actually at the bench collecting the data for us. So I'm going to start by talking about research misconduct. And I'll do this in two phases. I'll first talk about what research mis misconduct is, and then I'll talk about what research misconduct is not. Um, when we think about research mis misconduct, we usually use the acronym FFP, F for fabrication, F for falsification, and F for plagiarism. And I'll just take a second to remind you what all these things mean. Fabrication is literally making up the data. Um, clearly, that is not a responsible way to conduct biochemistry and molecular biology research, because if you make up the data, then I clearly cannot trust your data, nor can I base my new experiment, my new project, my new grant on the data that you have falsely represented in a paper that's been published. The second F is falsification. This essentially is you've collected the data in an appropriate manner, but now you manipulate it in some way. The classic way this happens is somebody harvests, um, somebody runs a gel, and then they cut and paste the bands so that they, or, or they change the intensity of the bands, so they tell the story that the investigator wants to, just wants to tell. That clearly is not a responsible way to conduct biochemistry and molecular biology, biology research because, again, I can't trust your data if you've manipulated them and they are no longer telling the story they were meant to tell. And then finally, there's plagiarism. This is something you've probably heard about since you were knee high in, in grade school. You don't copy from others. Well, here, essentially, plagiarism means you don't steal other people's ideas. That includes not stealing their work um, when it comes to taking um, the copying um, text, for example, but it also refers to things like when you're reviewing a paper or reviewing a grant. You don't steal somebody else's idea before it's out there for general consumption by the biochemistry and molecular biology um, community. So research misconduct, misconduct literally is fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism. And to be honest, you, you may be hearing this for the first time today, but you've really heard it ever since you were knee-high to a grasshopper. And the reason I say that is another way to think of fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism is fabrication, fabrication is lying, falsification is cheating, and plagiarism is stealing. And by the way, I stole or borrowed this slide from one of my colleagues here at the University of Georgia, Chris King. Um, I'm, I imagine since uh, kindergarten, you've been told, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal. That is, those essentially are the tenets of research misconduct. So I've told you what research misconduct is. Let me tell you what research, conduct, research misconduct is not. It is not, as I said on this slide, honest error or honest differences in, interpret, in interpretations or judgments of data. And that's where things can become very, very gray. Um, some people will, will view a piece of data or view a report as being um, completely appropriate. Other folks with their different biases and their different lenses will view it as being inappropriate. Long story short, each institution has a robust structure to investigate research mis misconduct and essentially determine whether an honest error of, of, of judgment or an honest uh, difference in opinion is, is um, underlying the problem or if there's actually been a case of falsification, plagiarism, or um, fabrication. And so again, this is something that an institution has structures in place to assess for you. Um, to ensure that to ensure the integrity of the biochemistry and molecular biology um, research enterprise. I think solid, I, I think appropriate um, uh, research always starts with your research design. And so if you want to conduct your research in an ethical manner, you need to think about how you design your experiment, how you des design your project in the first place. And so I thought it was appropriate at this point to stop a minute and talk a little bit about research to de design and give you some thoughts on things you might do to ensure that you design your experiments in a way that they're going to be reproducible, that they're going to generate valid data, and that ultimately you're going to be able to interpret those data with, with minimal bias. So the first thing is to start with a testable hypothesis. And the reason I have a question mark here is, you know, there's a very robust field of, of literature now, a very ro robust way of, of designing experiments that actually doesn't start with a testable hypothesis. 
uh, much of the discovery work that's being done now is very, very exciting. And so while testable hypotheses are important for some projects, in other cases, you don't necessarily have to start with a hypothesis. You basically instead say, I'm going to cast a wide net, I'm going to run proteomics, for example, and the hypotheses will fall out of the data that I collect. What is important is to ensure that when you collect those data, you can interpret them in a way that minimizes your bias. So how do you do that? My statistician friends tell me that upfront, it's important to decide what your analysis methods are going to be. And by analysis methods, I don't just mean the technical analysis, analysis methods, but also the methods you're going to use to statistically analyze your data and determine whether they're statistically significant. The reason I say you should do that upfront before you collect the data is once you've collected the data and had a chance to look at them, you may start cherry picking the methods you use to analyze the data so you can get the, you can get the uh, hypothesis to, you can, uh, verify the hypothesis that you've already developed. So it's important to select those analysis methods up front because that way you have a more unbiased way of analyzing your data and ultimately interpreting them. The statistical design piece is an, a critical part of the design of any project. And I would encourage you, if, especially if you're going to be working with large data sets, to reach out to your, your statistician colleagues early on in the process and make sure they're, they're involved at the design phase of your project and aren't just brought in at the very end. My statistician friends tell me one of their big pets peeves is when they're brought in at the very end and essentially told to analyze the data so they can validate a particular hypothesis. That's not an appropriate way to conduct research and it's certainly not something that statisticians are comfortable with. And then finally, always remember you need to, re you need to um, adhere to any legal guidelines, guidelines for the engagement of research subjects, whether they're human subjects or animal subjects, and I'll have more to say about that in just a couple of minutes. So once you've designed the study, the next step is to collect the data. And here are just a few words on, on what I think are best practices for collecting data. In my opinion, properly collected data um, end up in some kind of notebook, whether that's a virtual notebook or a tangible notebook. But long story short, they tell a story. And they kind of tell a story the same way you tell a story when you write a paper. So when you write a paper, you usually start with an introduction to explain why you did the project or why you did the experiments. And the same thing should happen here. For each experiment, it should be clear why the data were collected. It should also be clear where the data are being stored. I can't tell you how important this is. In a couple of slides, we'll talk a little bit about retention of data and the fact that um, sponsors actually require you to return, retain data for a certain period of time. Um, in fact, if your research is sponsored by an agency like the NIH or NSF, they could potentially come on campus and ask to see your data. And when I say data, I don't mean the manipulated graph that you generated at the end. They might ask to see the raw data. So it's really important to keep track of where you've stored your data. And although on the day you're doing your experiment, you may know exactly where those data are stored, believe me, six, eight months later, a year later, when you're writing up the paper, you may have completely forgotten how you stored those data. So remembering where you stored them, writing that down, and making sure they're stored in a secure and appropriate place is an incredibly important part of collecting data. The next phase is um, it's essentially the results phase. So you not only need to collect the data, but you also need to explain what you saw and what you didn't see. Um, you're never as close to your experiment as you are immediately after you've collected your data. I always tell my students this. And so once you collect the data, sit down, ponder over the data, and just write down your first impressions. In some cases, you're going to be really excited because they verify the hypothesis, and now you're designing the next experiment. In other cases, you're going to be disappointed because you didn't get the data that you expected. Either way, you're going to learn something. And again, I think a proper way to collect data is to make those observations immediately after you've collected them, because you're never going to be as close to those data. You're never going to be as intimate with that experiment as you are when you're in immediately after you've collected the data. The next phase is essentially uh, like the results section of a paper, write an interpretation. So now that I've collected these data, I've had a chance to ponder them, what do I interpret? What do I think happened here? And this kind of leads to the last bullet on that slide, and that is to describe how those data are going to influence the next set of experiments you do. Um, in this way, your data, each experiment, kind of tells a story. And I think you'll find that if you follow these steps, you, it'll be much easier to write your papers. The papers almost write themselves because you're logically moving from one experiment to another. So as I mentioned before, um, there are actually requirements to retain data. At my own institution, we recommend that, you, that data are stored for three to seven years, and the length of time they're actually stored depends on the sponsor. For example, NIH requires that data are stored for at least three years after the last financial report is, is, um, is submitted. 
NSF requires, a, it also has a three-year window, as you can see here. But there are other agencies that require other periods of time. The long story short is if you have sponsored research, and many of us in biochemistry and molecular biology do, it's important to know what your sponsor requires. Once you know what your sponsor requires, you in turn need to set up your, your practices so that you ensure that the data have, are not only stored for, set for that period of time, but that also you know where they're stored and you can access them if you're asked to produce them. And it is possible that a sponsor may, may come and ask you to produce the data. Another thing a sponsor may ask you to do is, is share the data. And that's very, very common when it comes to um, federal sponsors. And more and more private foundations are expecting this as well. Um, again, it's important to check with your sponsor to ensure that you know what the requirements are in terms of sharing your data. Typically, the data are going to be shared in the form of a manuscript that will be reviewed and ultimately become a paper. More about that in just a few minutes. Now, for those of us who are working on, on projects that are potentially commercializable, there's an issue of intellectual property or IP that comes into play here. IP is important, and my friends in IP tell me if you have a really cool idea that's potentially marketable, before you write an abstract, before you write the paper, before you present the work at a, at a meeting, be sure and protect it. It's very, very easy to get a provisional patent for an idea, and it doesn't take very long, and it doesn't take a whole lot of money. So if you think you've got a cool idea that's potentially marketable, walk down to your technology transfer office and have a conversation. But recognize that your interest in protecting your work does not change your obligation that you have to share the work. And again, a provisional patent will allow you to protect the work, um, well, to protect the work, but it will also allow you a window so that you can share the work as well. Um, I only throw FOIA up there, the Freedom of Information Act, to remind you that if your data are sp publicly sponsored, it is possible that people can ask to see the data. And by people, I mean not just the, not just the sponsor, but potentially the general public. So again, in biochemistry and molecular biology, one of the primary ways that we share our data is by way of authorship, by way of writing papers, um, writing manuscripts that turn into papers. And I thought it was critical at this juncture to talk a little bit about the criteria for authorship. And I could think of no better place to find criteria for authorship than to look at the instructions on the, um, the website of the Journal of Lipid Research. And that's what the link down there at the bottom will take you to. So I'm just going to go through this in a little bit of detail to um, remind you not only what the criteria are for authors, but also, also what your responsibilities are if you are indeed an author of a paper. Now, who determines whether a person should be an author on a paper? That's really up to the research team. And it's very, very important at the beginning of your project, and quite frankly, as the project matures and, and evolves during the course of the project, that you continually have conversations about who should be on the paper, where they should be on the paper. I say this is particularly important for graduate students because it's not uncommon that a graduate student does the work, writes the first draft of the paper, the paper gets submitted, the manuscript, I should say, gets submitted, by the time the manuscript comes back and more experiments are, are requested, the student has already graduated and left the lab. So what happens to the student's authorship? Do they return, retain first authorship? Does that change? Important conversation to have before you leave the lab. Anyway, back to what we're talking about. What are the criteria for authorship? To be an author on a paper, you should have made a substantial contribution to the work that's in the paper. Now, that contribution can come in many different forms. It might be that you were involved in the design phase. It could be that you were involved in data acquisition. Maybe you did the analyses, or maybe you contributed to the interpretation. All of these are potential criteria, potential fodder for becoming an author on a paper. And again, whether you actually are author on the paper or in the acknowledgments, for, ex for example, is a discussion that you need to have with your research team. Another criterion for authorship is you could be involved in drafting the paper, or you might be involved in revising it when it comes back from the, re from the reviewers. In, that, in, in those cases, you may not have been involved in the initial design or even in the, in the data acquisition, but because you played a fundamental role in preparing the paper, you deserve authorship. Again, what determines whether you actually get that authorship is a negotiation that you need to have with your research team. Anyone who's an author on a paper should have the opportunity to approve the final version of the paper. And this is a place where things can get real sticky for graduate students, again, because it's not uncommon a student has actually left the lab before the final version of the paper has been approved and is ready to go out for publication. So important to not completely sever those ties when you leave the lab. Make sure you keep a hand in things, and the reason for that will become clear in just a couple of minutes. Recognize that as an author on a paper, you are accountable for all components of the paper. And this comes back to things like mis research misconduct, for example. 
let's say you're an author on a multi-author paper and you did only one small part of the paper. Maybe you collected the data, but someone else did the data analyses. Um, perhaps you prepared the animals, animals but someone else did the, um, did the mass spec to, look, to do metabolomics. The metabolomics data that are in, although you didn't generate the metabolomics data that are in that manuscript, you are responsible for, for all phases of the manuscript if you're an author on the paper. And that's important because, let's go down to the bottom, look at the very, very last bullet. You share, if, if there is any, any, if any part of the paper is found to be faulty or in violation of ethical, ethical standards, you st share responsibility with all your co-authors. What does this mean? Well, it means you need to be careful who you work with, number one. But it also means that you, if you accept authorship on a paper, you need to read the paper, you need to make sure you understand the paper, you need to make sure that you can vouch for everything that's in that paper. No one's asking you to become a mass spec expert if you're not a mass spec ex expert, but you should know enough about mass spec to know whether the data were collected properly, the data were analyzed properly, properly and ultimately the interpretations were appropriate. So I've really already gone through most of what's on this slide. Um, this is just a reiteration of your responsibilities as an author. I'm just going to point out a couple more things here. Um, one of them, this, this um, choose an appropriate venue, this is an important piece as well. There are a lot of places you can potentially publish a paper. And let's not forget that in the, open, open, in the era of open science, publishing a paper is not just publishing a paper in a journal. It could also be that, you've, um, that it's posted on a postprint server, for example, on one of the open access servers. So important to choose the right venue for your paper to ensure that the people who need to consume the information, that is the research community that needs to build on the work you've done, have access to that information and can act on it and push the field forward. Um, another thing I'll point out on this slide, acknowledge your sponsors. Um, nothing is more frustrating as a sponsor, and I can say this having worked for the NSF, than knowing that you supported a project and not seeing any note on that project to indicate that your support was used to generate the data. You never know when a sponsor is going to be in the room. So even if you're just giving a seminar at your home institution um, as a research in progress, for example, always important to recognize who helped to support the work that you've done. <clears throat> Finally, it's also important to disclose conflicts of interest. And we'll get to conflict of interest in another slide or so. So the flip side of this is you as an author submit the paper, there's a panel of peer reviewers who will review the paper and determine whether it's actually acceptable for publication. And I think it's important to talk about that side as well. Many of you are probably already peer reviewers. Some of you will be peer reviewers in the, in the future. It's important to recognize that research ethics come into play when you're on the peer review side, just as they come into play when you're on the author side. So as a peer reviewer, obviously you need to be confident. You have to understand the work. If you don't understand the work or you don't have a frame of reference to interpret the work, you should decline the opportunity to review. Obviously it's important to be, to be impartial. You should let the data speak for themselves. If the data are speaking for themselves, then you, should, then you should be able to interpret those data in as unbiased a manner as possible. Recognize again, we all have biases. Also recognize that we all have conflicts of interest, something I'll talk about in more detail in just a few minutes. Your goal as a peer reviewer is not to eliminate conflict of interest and bias because you can't eliminate them. It's to minimize them and disclose them so that the people who read your review can interpret your review through the proper lens. It's important as a reviewer to be responsive, to turn things around in a, in a, a timely manner, and to maintain confidentiality of the process. Um, most peer review is, um, is uh, what we call single blind, which means you know that the, the peer reviewer knows the the, uh, the name of the author, the author doesn't know the name of the peer reviewer, it's important that you maintain that. It's also important that you not share anything that hasn't been published, that's now not out in the public domain, because again, that's a breach of confidentiality. The last bullet on the slide I think is the most important one, and that's the idea of, of humility. As you go further and further in your career and you become a bigger and bigger expert in what you're working on, it, it can become very easy to think that you know everything and that your interpretations are the only proper interpretations. Um, that's kind of a lousy way to do science because the new upstart idea, the new upstart in, um, interpretation is the one that really pushes the field forward. So being a little humble, recognizing that other people can bring new, fresh, exciting ideas to the table is very, very important. It's important if you're an author, and it's also important if you're a peer reviewer.
I'm going to touch on conflict of interest in the next couple of slides because this is a critical, critical piece of the responsible conduct of research in biochemistry and molecular biology, and, and indeed in the responsible conduct of research in, in any discipline. And to start that discussion, I just want to read what's on the slide verbatim. We often find ourselves faced with two or more competing interests, creating the perception, if not the reality, of an increased risk for bias or poor judgment. That's what conflict of interest is. And what's critical here is we're not just talking about reality, we're also talking about perception. In other words, if you are in a position where a reasonable person might perceive that you have some bias, whether it's positive bias or negative bias, for or against the work, you should not be involved in the review of that work. That's what conflict of interest is. And conflict of interest comes in a lot of different shapes and sizes. Um, in some cases, conflict of interest is related to your financial obligations, for example. Um, for example, if a, if a company has given you um, a grant to do work on a project, well, if you have the opportunity to review work that comes out of that company or to um, review a paper that has people from that company on it, you may not be the best reviewer for that paper because, again, you've had, you have a financial relationship with the company that may create a sense of bias. You may know in your heart that you're not biased and you can do this in a completely impartial manner. But the fact that a reasonable person might say, this person has gotten money from the company, they could be biased, that gives the perception of a conflict of interest. In this case, it is your responsibility to step back and say, I won't be involved in this review. Bottom line, it's important to disclose your interests. In some cases, those interests are going to be financial. In other cases, they're going to be personal relationships. For example, if you're a graduate student, you graduate, you go on to have your own lab, you're asked to review a, a, a a proposal from your um, from your thesis advisor, you, there's a potential for, for bias there. Whether it's positive or negative, someone may have the perception that you would be biased in one way or the other um, when it comes to reviewing the work of your, of your thesis advisor. So again, conflict of interest is not something that goes away. It's something we manage, and we largely manage it by first disclosing it, and second, managing it. That is stepping back when there's a potential of even a perception that we might be in conflict. I'm only going to mention human, re human subjects research and animal research very, very briefly. Um, largely, I just want to direct you to talk to your human subjects and animal subjects um, offices. Um, the reason I put this in the presentation is, um, particularly for graduate students, I, I, I want you to recognize that if you're doing work that involves human subjects, and that's what this slide is about, I stole this from Kim Fowler, by the way, or animal subjects, and that's what this slide is about, I stole this one from, this one from Leanne Auer. Um, and I don't mean stole, this is supposed to be an ethical conversation. I borrow these and they know I'm using them. Um, if your project involves animals or human subjects, it's important to find out whether you have approved protocols. Um, if your protocols aren't approved, well, not only are you not conducting your research ethically, there's a the potential that you may not be able to publish your research and or be able to include those data in your, in your thesis or dissertation. So it's worthwhile for graduate students to have a conversation with their mentors and ensure that you not only have an approved protocol, but that approved protocol is um, that the that the dates on that approved pro protocol have not expired. So in my last couple of minutes chatting with you, I want to talk a little bit about mentoring. Remember, that was that third set of bullets in the ASBMB Code of Conduct. And it's a very, very important part of, um, of how we do research and how we conduct research ethically. Because again, it's the trainees in the laboratories who are doing most of the research that ultimately leads to the wonderful papers and the grant proposals and the fabulous seminars that we see when we go to the, the ASBMB meeting. You can divide mentoring into three kind of broad categories, and an ideal mentor should be in a position to help you with at least two of these categories and hopefully all three. I mean, almost any research mentor should be able to provide you with instrumental mentoring. This is basically the subject expertise. It's the technical skills. It's the theoretical background. It's the things you need to be functional in the lab so you can conduct the experiments and ultimately write your thesis or, or write your dissertation and, and, and move on. Most mentors, I would say, are in position to provide this. And if they're not in, in position to provide it, they know someone who can, so they might assign you to a postdoc or perhaps even another faculty member at your institution or another that can provide you with the instrumental mentoring that you need. Psychosocial mentoring is a little more challenging for some mentors. It's emotional support. I wouldn't call it cheerleading, cheerleading but it's essentially the, the kinds of, kind of support that helps you on that day when you've worked for 12 hours on an experiment, the experiment didn't work out, 
The data aren't what you thought they would, but you gotta come in the next day and do another experiment. It's the person who can help you to manage that, that failure and turn failure in, into an opportunity to learn. Um, most mentors do this reasonably well. They have to because everybody has failed experiments and they, they have to help their students to get through those failed experiments. Not everyone's great at psychosocial. Where I think mentoring often kind of slips for, for many mentors is in the career and sponsorship or professional development mentoring. And that's in large part because you're all working for folks who are faculty members. And quite frankly, being a faculty member myself, I can tell you, I know how to be a faculty member. I don't know how to be a science writer. I don't know how to be a science policy person. And because of that, some of us shy away from having those conversations with our, with our students, with our mentees. An ideal mentor has the ability to have that conversation with you. And even if he or she doesn't have the expertise, they know who to send you to so you can have a more in-depth conversation about the actual career path of your choice. Chances are, I'm sorry, sorry to say, you won't find one single person who can hit the instrumental, the psychosocial, and the sponsorship mentoring. Indeed, most people are well served by having a team of mentors, and I encourage you to look around your institution and identify multiple people who can help you with the, men the various um, levels of mentoring that you'll need to get through graduate school and aspire to your career. Now, in the context of all this, um, mentors have responsibilities, and I'll talk about some of them on this slide. Um, as I've just mentioned, they're responsible for your intellectual development and your technical skills. Um, some of your mentors are going to help you to choose classes, so they're involved in academic advising. And again, most mentors do that reasonably well. The stuff at the bottom of the slide sometimes is a little bit more slippery. This networking and socialization, for example, points to the fact that when you go to a meeting, the best mentor in the world is going to introduce you to their friends. They're going to introduce you to potential postdoc mentors. They're going to introduce you to people who work in the field and perhaps have a piece of instrumentation or have a technique that would be useful to you. They're essentially bringing you into the fold. They're socializing you, helping you to become a card-carrying member of the biochemistry and molecular biology research community. And again, that's a responsibility of mentors. Unfortunately, it doesn't always happen. Your mentors should model professionalism, including ethical behavior and the responsible conduct of research. An ideal mentor should reserve time for a regular meeting with you. Hopefully, it's an individual meeting in addition to a group meeting where you can share your work with a larger group and get feedback from a group of people. And probably most importantly, I think an ideal mentor is going to spend time on a performance evaluation for you. They'll give you a sense of what you do well and what you do poorly. And if there are things you do poorly, they'll also give you some steps you can take to right those wrongs so you can be the best student in biochemistry and molecular biology that you can possibly be. That information I put down there in red, that a good mentor puts the interests of his or her trainee above those of the project, very, very important. The best mentors do that. They ensure that, you're, that you get out of the project just as much as they do, and that it becomes a critical step in your, your own particular career ladder, whether you're going to stay in academia or aspire to a different type of career. Just as mentors have responsibilities, so too do trainees. And it's important for students to recognize this. you got to be responsible. More and more, you need to be proactive. At the beginning, it's fine to depend on people, but ultimately, you need to become in charge of your own project. In fact, at the end of your project, you should know more about it than your mentor does. Um, you should become the person who's driving the project forward, the expert who, who's ensuring that the experiments are done in an ethical manner. You should be respectful of your mentor's time. Um, believe it or not, your mentors aren't just sitting in their, in their offices waiting for students to come in and ask, and ask them questions. They have multiple responsibilities. It's important to recognize that, and just as you should be respectful of their time, a thank you now and then is a wonderful way to continue engaging your mentor and ensure that your mentoring relationship stays on, on good footing. Um, Obviously, it's important to conduct research in a responsible manner. That's what this, um, this uh, seminar has been all about. Um, but also recognize that the responsible conduct of research extends beyond the things we talked about today. It's also about how you engage other people who are involved in the research. And so you should strive to be a good, uh, responsible member of your, of your research team. I, I call it laboratory citizenship. Finally, again, as, as a student, your goal is ultimately to graduate and move on, but the way you do that essentially is by evolving. And the goal is to evolve to become a colleague and not just a trainee. Again, you should be the person who's got the deep level expertise in the project. You should be the person who's thinking up the experiments and helping, the, helping to, um, to write the next grant proposals. When you get to that point, then you know that you have been a responsible trainee. Now, try as we may, not all mentoring relationships work out well. Um, and as a graduate dean, I see dysfunctional mentoring relationships all too often. 
And these are just some tips that um, you can think about when it comes to managing those, um, those dysfunctional relationships. I think it's always important to try and um, manage those relationships at the local level to the degree that you can. So start by trying to talk to your mentor. Um, recognize the fault could be on your side as well. That's what the soul searching bit is, it bit is about. But if those things don't work, there are additional structures um, above and beyond your own little research group that can help you to resolve a dysfunctional mentoring relationship. And so in the interest of time, I won't read through all of these because I really do want to get to the case, which, um, which is here on the next slide. Should we stop for questions now, Danielle, or go right into the case? Um, let's go into the case. Um, I don't have okay. any, no one had asked any questions um, yet in the chat box. So let's try the case study and right. you know, maybe there will be questions generated from that as well. So it's, it's all crystal clear. So, um, so cases are a, a wonderful teaching tool when we teach the responsible conduct of research. And in my class, we usually start with a case at the, at the beginning of, of class to kind of set the tone. And then we have another case at the end of class. Um, the way we do these cases is typically we, um, we summarize the case, we give people a chance to think about the case, and then we ask them to, um, to respond. Um, it's a little more challenging to do this in a webinar, webinar type format. So what I'm gonna do is summarize the case for you, and then you should see a little box, I see it on my screen, that will um, have a series of yes, no questions. And what we'd like you to do is just check yes or no. Um, please know that uh, we, we're not gonna attribute the yes or no to you, although there's some backend um, coding that would allow us to do that. I would promise whether you answer yes or no, we're not gonna know which one you, cho you chose. But I hope you all will choose to participate in the case. So to summarize the case, there's a renowned uh, molecular biologist named Dr. Ethicos, and he's studying a really, really cool new protein called Survivin. And so he's a well-known person in his field. He gets a paper from somebody called Dr. Spacely, and Dr. Spacely has identified a new binding partner for Survivin. It's called GFX. And it's an intriguing study, but when Dr. Ethicos reads the, reads the manuscript, he realizes that the data are, are not very, very convincing, there are controls that are missing, um, the interpretations aren't completely valid. And so it's, this paper is just basically not ready for prime time. So long story short, Dr. Ethicos sends the paper back for major revisions, um, and, but he keeps this idea of the, the binding partner in the back of his mind because it is an intriguing observation. So a couple of weeks later, um, Dr. Ethicos is in her, in her office and her student wanders in and it turns out the student has been trying to, trying to culture some cells that depend on surviving and the cells are just dying, they're not surviving. In the back of Dr. Ethicos' mind, she remembers, wait a minute, there's this binding partner that seems to enhance the, um, the functionality, and en enhance the function of surviving. I wonder if maybe we should add the two together and then maybe my student's cells will survive. So, Based on that, um, we want to ask you the following questions. Given what you know from this brief description of the case, should Dr. Ethicos have refused to review this paper? In other words, was Dr. Ethicos in conflict of interest? And I'll give you a few seconds to respond. All right, looks like everybody has voted. I'm gonna end the poll and broadcast the results. So is this what okay. you thought? Can you see them okay? Every Can everyone see them? So 75% of you said that Dr. Ethic Dr. Ethicos was not in conflict of interest when she reviewed the paper. And, and I would agree with that interpretation. By the way, these are interpretations and for many of these questions, there won't be a right or wrong answer, but I agree with your interpretation. In fact, when you, when peer reviewers are selected, they're selected to have frame of reference so they can appreciate the importance of the work. And so I agree with you. I think Dr. E Dr. Ethicos was very much in, in, in the right in choosing to uh, accept the invitation to review this paper. Let's move on to the second question. Should Dr. Ethicos suggest that her student, Sarah, add that, bind that binding partner, GFX, to the cells? Yes or no? Wow, interesting. All right, we'll give you 10 more seconds, so log your votes now. 
very interesting. So in this case, we've got about a 60-40 split. So about 60% of you, 56.6 to be accurate, said no, Dr. Dr. Ethico should not suggest that Sarah add GFX to the cells. And, and I'm going to agree with you on that. Again, this is my interpretation, no right or wrong here. But, I, but the, the rule of thumb, if the paper is not out for public consumption, then you should not be using the data in that, in that paper to, um, to enrich your own research. Um, same thing is true of a grant proposal. You know, people include preliminary data in their grant proposals. If those data have not been published, then you should not be using them for your research as well. Okay, third question. How long should Dr. Dr. Ethicos be required to wait before mentioning this experiment to Sarah? And I've kind of already answered this one, so maybe we should just move on to the next one. Um, again, once the paper's been published, then Dr. Ethicos should feel free to share the information with Sarah. Um, there are a couple of interesting responses here, though, and I'll see what you guys think of them. I'd started broadcasting the results anyway a little bit, so uh, this one will not be as blind as the others. This is my fault for giving away the, the answer, although I think there are two other responses that are interesting. Well, I'm glad to see that no one hit on A or, or E. Um, no waiting time. We've just, we've just talked about that. Um, never mention, of course, once the paper is published, it's fine to mention it. And, and most people agree that that would be the appropriate time to talk to Sarah. Um, if Dr. Spacely pre presents the work at a national meeting, that's a tough one. We encourage people to present unpublished work at national meetings. And one of the reasons we see so little unpublished work at some national meetings, of course not at the ASBNB meeting, but at others, is that people are afraid to present their unpublished work because they think just this kind of thing is going to happen. So I would argue that it is not appropriate to share these data with Sarah if the paper, if the results have only been presented at a national meeting. In terms of a collaboration, if you've actually had a conversation with Dr. Ethicos, I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Spacely, and Dr. Spacely has indicated that he or she is willing to collaborate and you can share the data, then I think that would be just fine. But we would need a little more information on item B, that is, we need to know the nature of the collaboration, I think, before we could give a, um, a solid answer on that one. So one last question. I think we have two questions. We have uh, two last questions, my bad. <laughs> uh, would your answer to questions two and three be different if Sarah came if Sarah came to you and was frustrated and basically ready to give up on graduate school? Obviously, we're dealing with a very ethical group of people here, um, and, and I agree with you on this one as well. Um, the, the expediency doesn't, doesn't trump ethics, and so the, the fact that the student is frustrated is, is not a reason to violate ethical conduct. Okay, this is our last question. If you were Dr. Ethicos, would your course of action differ if another professor independently mentored that there was a rumor that there might be an interaction between Survivin and this new partner protein? All right, we'll give you 10 more seconds. So again, it looks like we have about a 60-40 split with 60% of you saying no. Um, this is a tough one. Um, rumors are rampant in science and rumors are a, a way that a lot of information gets passed from one person to another. Um, it's important to know where the information came from in this case. You know, if that colleague just came back from study section and maybe saw this um, information in a grant proposal, um, then clearly it wasn't appropriate for the individual to share that information and it's also not appropriate for you to act on that information. So I would say in this case it's important to talk to the colleague and get a sense of where the, how the rumor got started. Um, did, was this told to this person in confidence? Was it um, conveyed to them in a, in a, in a confidential manner? Um, if so, then it is not appropriate for you to act on that information. Not appropriate to tell your student to add the, the, um, 
both the binding protein, the binding partner to her cultured cells. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks for going through the, the exercise of that case. I hope it helped to illustrate some of the um, principles of the responsible conduct of research that we talked about today. And I've covered all that I want to cover. Um, I do have a page of resources that may be helpful to you. Um, each of these links is live and will take you to, um, to a resource that may be helpful to you as you further explore the responsible content of research. Again, we were only able to hit some of the highlights today. There's a lot more beneath what we talked about. I encourage you to get involved in responsible conduct of research training at your own institutions. Um, you should have courses and workshops that are available to you. If you don't have them at your home institutions, um, some of these links will take you to short courses and, um, and uh, videos that are available online that can help you to master the responsible conduct of research. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Well, one question that we had submitted um, before the webinar um, was how as a mentor do you create an environment where your trainees are doing their research in an ethical manner when you might not be in the lab all the time? Um, you know, when you're doing other administrative work, when you're teaching, writing grants, you know, how do you make sure that your students um, are doing their research ethically? Um, and I guess we could ask the converse question too. Um, if you're a trainee, um, what recourse do you have if your advisor might not be handling things ethically? Mm, good question. Well, why don't we start with the first question? So, um, you know, obviously the, the first step is to model the behavior that you want your trainees to, to express. And so the, the mentor, him or herself, needs to make it clear that they, that they conduct research in a responsible manner and that they absolutely will not tolerate anyone who does not do that. Um, modeling the behavior, I think, is, is the number one thing. But like you said, it's, it's, you know, it, there are times when research mentors can't be in the laboratory to watch people 24-7. I think in that case, it's important to make it clear that um, to the group that this is a part of our group culture. Um, that um, group members are expected not only to conduct their research in, a respect, in a, an ethical manner, but they're also responsible for reporting other group members if they don't do this. Um, in other words, everybody in the group needs to hold everybody else responsible for conducting the research in a responsible manner. Um, this is essentially what our responsible conduct of research training is all about. Um, I train you and then you go out and, and practice your research ethically and that in turn spreads the, the knowledge, so to speak, so that um, we get more and more ethical research conducted in, in, our, in our community. But it starts with, within the little research group itself. And again, it's about the um, mentor setting the right example and then ensuring that everybody not only holds to that standard, but that they hold each other to the standard as well. Oh, and the flip side was if you're a mentee, what do you do if, um, if your mentor is in behaving in a responsible manner? And that can be really hard as a mentee because, you know, in some, time, in some ways your, um, your career kind of depends on this mentor, right? It could be this is the person who's going to ultimately sign off on your dissertation. Or they're the ones who, who's going to provide you with the letter that you need to get into medical school or graduate school or dental school. Um, and so it may be challenging and it may be very hard to have these kinds of conversations directly with your mentor. I'd say the first thing is, is make sure that you're in the right. Make sure you haven't misinterpreted anything. Make sure you haven't, um, you're not um, seeing something that's not actually there. Maybe run it past the other people in your research team first and ask them if this is a current concern for them as well or if they've noticed something that's amiss. Um, there's, hopefully there's at least somebody else, some other person in the department whom you can trust, um, particularly someone at a faculty level. I would say going to have a conversation with a graduate coordinator, for example, or a graduate program director might be a good choice. Um, in a really a difficult case, you might even go to a department head and express your concerns about the way that research is being done. You know, an, an allegation of research misconduct is something that's very, very serious. Um, it has, by um, definition, it has to be reported to the sponsors. So if a research misconduct allegation occurs and you're funded by NSF, NSF has to be informed. And if ultimately it's found that you have committed research misconduct, then that, that's a very, very public thing. I mean, there's a public um, website that lists the research misconduct um, at, at NIH that, that lists the research mis misconduct cases that have been, um, that, that have been resolved. And so, so it can be very embarrassing for, a, um, for an institution for this to happen. And, and for that reason, if you do suspect research misconduct as a student, it is important for you to step forward. But just recognize there, there, there are potential risks, and I understand that.
Okay, great. Um, well, thank you so much for your insight, Suzanne. Um, are there any final words that you would want to share with the group? Well, again, I would say take advantage of the research, um, tr research ethics training you have available to you on campus. Um, most campuses have at least one course. Um, some of them have ongoing courses so you can take refreshers. Recognize that if you're um, working on sponsored projects, there's an expectation that you have research ethics training at each phase of your, um, of your training. So if you've had it as a graduate student, you're going to do it again as a postdoc. A and then just, just go out there with your eyes open and, and um, be, be willing to recognize and, and, um, and report when other people aren't conducting their research properly. You know, long story short, the, um, the integrity of our biochemistry and molecular biology research enterprise is dependent on each and every one of us who's doing research. And so you're an important part of ensuring that we can trust the data that are generated by um, people in the biochemistry and molecular biology community. And thank you for participating today. We did have one more question sneak in at the end, if, uh, and we should have time for a quick answer. Um, so if we have a person who's doing research with clinical samples, should the surgeon that supplies the samples be counted as an author? Oh, that's a good question. It's a question you're going to have to you have to talk about with your research team. But um, one question you could ask yourself is: Could I could I have done these experiments had I not had access to these samples? And if the answer is no, then I would say that that person has made a significant and important contribution to the research, and therefore should be considered um, for authorship. Now, where they are in the list of authors is another question, but I think that's a, I think you would certainly want to consider uh, making them an author. You need to make sure if they do become an author that they're in a position where, again, they're going to be responsible for every phase of that paper. And so if they're not in a position where they could reasonably explain the paper or defend the data to someone else in the field, then you might question whether that person should be an author or would be better um, in the acknowledgments. Great. Again, a conversation best to have with your local research team. Great. Well, thank you so much for that great question. And thank you, everyone, for attending. You can find an additional number of career resources on the ASBMB webpage. The ASBMB provides professional development programs based on expressed student, grad student and postdoc needs, and we hope you will take out the time to fill out a short survey about this webinar. The survey will be available upon meeting exit and be an email you will receive at the conclusion of the webinar. Thank you so much, and have a nice day. Thanks, everybody.